Good morning and welcome to Longview First Church of the Nazarene for our final Sunday of worship from home and this is Pentecost Sunday so we're going to celebrate the arrival of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to share a little bit we're going to do a couple of worship songs and then Nikki will bring the message and then next Sunday we will be worshiping together at church on H.G. Mosley all together social distancing and um, check out information uh, from the One Call Now, from the website, from social media for more details. I'm going to read to you uh, Acts chapter 2. This is the day of Pentecost. It says, On the day of Pentecost, seven weeks after Jesus' resurrection, the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames of tongues or fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the word spirit in Greek, this is just a little bit of a background, let's set my Bible down, is the word pneuma. And that makes me think of either pneumonia or pneumatic air gun. So pick which one you're more comfortable with. Uh, nobody wants pneumonia, so I think I'd pick the pneumatic air gun. Uh, but it has to do with air or breath. And um, it makes me think of creation that God breathed his breath of life into us. And that's, you know, part of the Holy Spirit's role, um, giving us the miracle of life, uh, God's breath, God's breathing into us. And so we celebrate today, uh, Pentecost. We're going to do a new song called King of Kings. And this is one that um, is appropriate for today. It's a timeline of God's work and the Holy Spirit is a part of that. And I want to do it together when we meet, when we meet again. Um, but this is a new one, so completely new for us at church. And um, just listen and enjoy. And you can look up the words. It's King of Kings by Hillsong. And uh, follow along. <laughs>
to share a message with you for Pentecost Sunday. Hey guys, my name is Nikki Harbison, if you don't know me, and um, I am privileged to be able to bring to you the message for today. It's become a little bit of a tradition that um, I'm honored to be able to do the Pentecost service. And um, man, I'm so missing being with you guys today because this is generally a time where we eat together and get to share all of the good things that God's been doing in our lives. But we are not going to let the fact that we are in our own homes stop us from celebrating today. Um, so as we get into this celebration, this focus on Pentecost Sunday, and we talk about what that means to us and what it means um, in just Christian tradition and Jewish tradition even. Um, my hope and prayer for you guys today, for all of us today, is that we are filled with joy um, and thanksgiving and gladness um, and a reminder of how much we really do have to celebrate um, today and every day, really, as God's people. So let's just start by praying. Um, if you'll pray with me, Father God, I thank you that you are with us, um, that it doesn't matter where we are or where we go. It doesn't matter if we're quarantined our, in our houses or if we're out working in our jobs, if we're on the front lines, um, Lord, if we're walking down the street, you're with us. And we are so grateful for the privilege that it is to have your Holy Spirit with us at all times. Um, what a wonderful and amazing thing that is. Father, I pray that you would help us to celebrate your provision and your presence today um, as we look at all of the gifts that you have given us in the past and that we continue to receive from you. 
We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Be with us today in your name. Amen. All right, guys. So today is Pentecost. Um, and this is the day that we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit, um, the, the baptizing of Jesus' followers with the Holy Spirit. Um, but it has a rich tradition and history outside of just our celebration of Pentecost. It's been known um, and celebrated. It's a Jewish festival called Shavuot, and, um, and it goes way back. And what's really cool, um, I think, always, is how God throughout history... Um, just shows how orderly and thoughtful uh, he is and how um, much of what we celebrate with um, uh, in our Christian faith mimics and fulfills what was put into place um, in the Old Testament. Um, and it's just amazing. It's amazing to see how, um, you know, Jesus' words where he says, I've not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it really plays out. And we can see that even in the celebration of Pentecost. So um, today's focus is really all about celebrating God. Um, so I hope that as you're watching this, you are um, sharing with whoever is there with you watching how grateful um, and thankful for you are for how God has provided for you and just the fact that you get to enjoy his presence um, no matter where you are. And that's that's going to be our focus for today. All right. Okay, so just a little bit of, of background and, and kind of filler information before we really get into it. Um, we celebrate um, Pentecost, which of course means Pente is 50. Um as the day that is 50 days since Passover. So that's when the Jewish festival Shavuot, they also called it Pentecost, um, would have been taking place. So to put this in New Testament perspective, Jesus has been crucified. He has arisen. Um, and then he spent 40 days teaching the apostles. Okay, so he was kind of sequestered with them, teaching them after he resur was resurrected. Um, and then he arose uh, or ascended into heaven and he left uh, directions, specific instructions for the disciples that said, basically, you guys stay here in Jerusalem um, because I'm going to send you a gift. So don't leave. Y'all just wait. And um, the gift that the Father has promised you is going to be given to you. Um, so that's a really hopeful thing and a promising thing. Um, so the two festivals are really cool. Well, the, the one festival and then the coming of the Holy Spirit that we celebrate. So just to give you background, Shavuot um, was a festival with many names in Jewish tradition. So it was the feast of the first fruits of the harvest of your labor. It coincided with the wheat harvest. It was also called the Feast of Weeks. Um, another name was the, the Festival of the Giving to Us of the Holy Torah. So really long names. Um, but this was a time when um, they would come together and they would celebrate and give thanks to God for just providing for them the basics of life. Um, and man, just that in and itself is a message for us today. Um, as we've been going through all of the craziness in our world right now, how many times have you just stopped and thanked God? You know what? Thank you that I have a house. Thank you that I have food on my table, um, that I, I have my good health um, even. But just thanking God for those, those basic provisions that he's made for us um, in our lives. Um, and then the other part of the celebration was recognizing God as the ultimate giver. James says that every good and perfect gift is from above, comes from God, from the Father of heavenly lights. Um, and so looking around, even beyond the basics of life, those are good things, and we can certainly celebrate God for those provisions. Um, but even more than that, every good gift that you have in your life um, do you recognize that as God's hand? Do you recognize that as a present from God to you? 
um, you know, when something good goes in your life, when, when you get that promotion maybe that you had been hoping for, or when um, you recognize that, man, I might have just been in a terrible accident except that, you know, something went right for me and I was saved. And do you thank God for his hand of provision in that? Um, and, you know, for good things that happen in your family, um, every good and perfect gift is from God. And so this time, um, this festival, this season is all about recognizing that God is the ultimate giver. Um, we think that we think we do good things and we think we give to others, but it's just not even a shadow of, um, the kind of giver that God is. And so they would recognize that recognizing God as the ultimate giver and giving him thanks for everything that, that we've been given. Um, what they would traditionally do uh, in the Jewish celebration of this festival is they would camp out with their family. So you guys feel free, go get your tents and go out in the backyard, um, camp out with your family, and they would stay up all night. Um, so this would be like super awesome time for the kiddos. Um, maybe not for the parents. I don't know. I struggle with staying up late. Um, but they would stay up all night, not just roasting marshmallows and having fun um, and, you know, just hanging out. They would stay up all night studying scripture. Um, how often have you tried that or done that or even tried just sitting down and studying scripture for a few hours on end? Um, they would dedicate their whole night to studying scripture. And traditionally, they would read from the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, and we're going to look at that a little bit today. And then they would study the book of Ruth. There are some connections there because David was um, in the line of Ruth. And um, he was said to have died during the, according to tradition during this festival. And so they incorporate the study of Ruth also into um, that all-night study session. Um, families would also bring sacrifices. So they would bring two loaves of bread um, made from the wheat harvest, the first fruits of their wheat harvest, because that's when this is, this falls in the, in the calendar, and, um, and then animal sacrifices too. And so that's kind of the, the shell of this festival. It doesn't have as many rules as um, most Jewish festivals do. So it was a little looser, um, but big time, um, a time of celebration and a time of Thanksgiving. Um, if you fast forward just a little bit, not too much, um, the disciples were waiting in Jerusalem as Jesus told them to do. He ascended into heaven. They were told, you know, what are you standing here for? The Son of Man will come back in the same way that he has been taken from you. In other words, he's going to be returning, so that's cause to celebrate. Um, but also, they just had this very vague instruction from Jesus to wait. Not wait for five days, not, okay, it's going to be two weeks. You're going to go to the festival of um, Shavuot, and then, boom, you're going to get a gift. They didn't have that specific instruction. They just had um, the call to wait. Um, and man is waiting hard. Uh, but they were obedient. And it is hard <laughs> um, to be obedient in a season of waiting, I think. So there's a good lesson for us there. Um, so when you read the book, book of Acts, which is largely um, what we're focusing on, you will see that um, after they waited for a little bit um, on the celebration of Pentecost or Shavuot, um, then they're blessed with that gift. And so Acts chapter 2 describes the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it says this, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Um, man, that is such a gift. Um, and we'll see later that that gift enabled them to do more of the work that Jesus had commanded them to do. Um, and, and we'll talk about that. But they needed that Holy Spirit to be able to do it. Um, so that is what we celebrate today. That coming, that outpouring, that baptism in mass of the Holy Spirit um, for Pentecost. But I think that there are some really interesting correlations between... 
um, what happened in uh, the Torah, the giving of the law, specifically in Exodus and God's people? What happened in Ruth with uh, Naomi and Ruth? And even what's happening with the Holy Spirit and what's happening today in our situation? Um, not to make light of anything um, in the Bible, because I think God has foreknown everything that was going to happen. And he knew even today we would be dealing with our own versions of quarantine, um, of having to deal with how do we get back into society? What is our role in society during this time? And I think that we'll see some parallels um, that in studying Exodus and in studying Ruth, we can see aspects of quarantining and re-entry into society, which is very similar to what we're dealing with today. And then the same with the Holy Spirit and the advent of the Holy Spirit. We're going to see in Acts um, parallels also with being quarantined and then dealing with re-entry into society um, and things being different and new. And so I hope you'll bear with me as we kind of explore these a little bit. And all throughout, um, no matter what the situation is, I hope that you also see the focus of celebration. Um, that where there is God, there is cause to celebrate, no matter the situation surrounding you. So let's start with Exodus and um, the, what would... Um, be in the traditional festival of Shavuot or Pentecost, they would study the Torah. We're going to specifically focus on Exodus. Now, generally, they would read all of Exodus chapters 19 and 20, which is where Moses goes to Mount Sinai, he's given the Ten Commandments, and he brings them back to the people. Um, I think if we look at this, we can see in even the giving of the Ten Commandments that God is sharing his presence with the people, with his people, and also giving them provision. Um, we think of rules maybe as something, you know, terrible or harsh or restricting, um, but they're really a story of God's love. It's really a story of God saying, I want to take care of you. Think of a parent taking care of a child. Um, and to be a good parent, you give those your children rules. It's a way of you providing for their safety. Um, now, remember at this point that the Israelites, pe Israelite people had been enslaved by Pharaoh. Um, God has um, given them freedom from that entrapment, that enslavement, and they are totally dependent on him. They've wandered the desert. They are being led by manifestations of God, um, you know, a, a cloud, pillar of smoke, pillar of fire, and, um, and then God actually appears um, in one form uh, to Moses. Um, and so they are getting to experience, the Israelites, the presence of God in a certain way. Now, it's not quite the way that we experience it today. So, um, for example, let's look at Exodus 19, chapter 9. I mean, Exodus chapter 19, verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Um, we see there that God desires to be present with his people, right? I'm going to come to you, not just Moses goes to God, but God is going to come to him. Um, and he wants the people to hear him speaking. Um, now that's great and cause to celebrate the fact that, um, the Israelite people get to hear the Lord speaking is incredible and it is cause to celebrate the fact that he has rescued them from their, um, being enslaved with Pharaoh. And he said, I want to be with you. I want you to be my people and I want to be your God. And um, that they get to experience any bit of his presence is amazing uh, and cause to celebrate. But there is a little a, a but here. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, we see that things were not just like, okay, now we're going to be with God all the time. Uh, Moses was allowed to go into God's presence to an extent, um, but the people really weren't. 
God sent Moses or gave Moses a list of restrictions. They had to purify themselves for three days. Um, they had to all be clean according to their law. Um, and even then, they only got to go to the foot of Mount Sinai. Uh, so we see in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, in other words, saw God's presence on the mountain, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. And so in a way, in a small way, the Israelite people were kind of quarantined from God. Um, they did not get to go directly into his presence. Um, they were certainly quarantined to themselves, wandering in the desert and weren't around anybody else for the most part. Um, they had left their society of Egypt, as oppressive as it was. Um, Moses gets to be their spokesperson, but they're not even allowed on the mountain. Okay, They get to sit back from a distance, um, a little more than six feet of social distancing between them and God. Um, God cares about them, and he is enacting to provide for them, and his presence is closer than it ever has been. Um, but still, it's not right there with them. Um, Moses gets to go, but the people still have to stay back in many ways. But even so, they can celebrate. Even so, they're given the Ten Commandments. Um, you know, they're, Moses is told that God is watching out for them, um, that he is attempting to keep them from sinning. Um, and so God is interacting in their lives. And even in that situation, um, when things are rough for them, I mean, traveling in the desert, that's rough. And just having depend, to depend on God to give them their food, their manna every day, um, requires a huge faith. And I'm sure, and we know from the Bible, there was grumbling and, and they were upset at times. Um, but what a wonderful thing that God cares so much about them to even come to that mountain, um, to take a hand in their lives. Um, and so even in the midst of their quarantine from God and from the societies that they were used to, um, they have cause to celebrate. Let's move now and look at Ruth. As tradition would hold, we looked a little bit of Exodus at Exodus, and now um, we'll take a second and look at Ruth. So the story of Ruth is um, it's one that I love. We have here in the story of Ruth um, a couple of, of storylines going on. And so you've got Naomi who has left her people with her husband and her sons. Um, her sons have married outside of um, the Israelite um, group. And so um, they've married Moabite women and Moabites were like enemies of the Israelites. So this is a bad deal. Um, and basically they left because of lack of faith. They heard there might be a famine. And so they're like, Psh, we're getting out of Israel. Uh, we're leaving this group. We're going to um, Moab um, where hopefully the famine won't hit. Well, turns out the famine hits there and it hits pretty bad. Um, and so Naomi loses everything right? Their livelihood, her husband, um, her sons. And so it's Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, Orpha and Ruth. And she's like, there's nothing else to do. All is lost. It's terrible. I'm going to go back home to my people. Um, and of course, Orpha is like, and Ruth both start out saying, well, we'll go with you. And Naomi is like, no, you would do better off going back to your people, which shows how much her faith has taken a hit here. Um, she's not saying, yes, come with me. My God will take care of you. I mean, she is desolate. No, you would be better off in Moab with your people and your families and their gods even. Um, what can I give you? Orpha basically says, okay, yeah, that makes sense, and she goes. Um, Ruth, however, says, no, I'm going to stay with you. Where you go, I will go, um, and your God will be my God, and uh, and goes with her. 
I do want you to see in this, for, for our purposes, Naomi and Ruth are both coming from places of severe suffering and hardship. And that might be a lot like what you're going through right now. Um, you know, people have lost jobs. It's hard to live in this new normal, so to speak, um, in our society. And um, people are dealing with sicknesses, with loss of, of loved ones, with not being able to be with our loved ones that are sick or maybe in nursing homes. There is a lot of suffering that, that is going on, not just in our little neck of the woods, but worldwide. Um, and, and that's not a new thing. Um, Jesus says that in this world, we will have trouble. And, um, and it's, it's been happening. Um, Naomi was suffering. She lost her whole family. And um, she was an alien in a foreign land. Um, when she goes back home, it's not as though things are just all of a sudden better. Um, and we see with her this idea of reentering into society. She's been away. Things are different. Um, and she no longer has her husband and sons to take care of her. It's just her and Ruth. And Ruth is a Moabite woman. Um, she's not even Jewish. And they get there and... They don't have money. We know that Ruth goes to the, the wheat harvest of Boaz and she's gleaning the leftovers. Um, and basically their law, the law tells anybody who's harvesting, who owns a field, to not pick every little tiny bit um, whenever they're harvesting the crops, but to leave some for the poor and the widows. And so that's what Ruth is going to glean right? I mean, these are giveaways for the poor, and she is just hovering there to hope that there's a little bit that she can get that's been left over so that she can provide food for her and for Naomi. And so they're dealing with this suffering, with poverty, um, with loss of family and loved ones, and Naomi is dealing with a loss of her faith, as we've seen. Um, but still, even as they re-enter into this new society, they find there is cause to celebrate because God is still with them. He provides a redeemer. For Naomi, he shows that she's never alone. He gives her Ruth to travel with her, to take care of her. Um, and through Ruth, Naomi is led back to God in her faith. Um, and for Ruth and also Naomi, he provides a kinsman redeemer in the form of Boaz. Um, who sees Ruth's heart and desire to help serve Naomi and is moved um, to care for them both. And he does. And he ends up marrying Ruth. They have a son. They become the line of David. Um, and it's a pretty amazing way that God redeems their situation. A couple of verses to look at. In Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, we read, the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge or shelter. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. So here we see Ruth finding provision and presence in Boaz, who comes to be in, in this book of the Bible, a representative of Jesus or God, that redeemer. Um, and so they are never without provision and presence here. In Ruth chapter four, we see that taken a little farther in verse 14. Then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. The Lord, look at this, the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer um, is attributing or, or praising or celebrating God's presence, right? He, you have not been left. Um, and friends, today, God has not left us. Um, never have we been left without a redeemer or the Lord's presence. And he shall be to even us a restorer of life and a nourisher of our old age. Um, and there is that provider um, aspect. And so we see that in Ruth going through a reentry into a new society when things are bleak and bad, that she still has, always has God's provision and his presence. And that is reason to celebrate.
All right, now let's look at the Holy Spirit and how that helps us um, continue to celebrate our provision and presence of God. So just as a reminder, we go into Acts. Um, Jesus has left his followers, and which could be a tough time. They're like, okay, you've been with us. We thought you died. You arose. That is amazing. And we had you with us for a while. And then what? You left us again? Um, and But Jesus promises um, that if they wait there in Jerusalem, they will receive a gift. Um, and here's his command in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so here... Um, they're essentially commanded to shelter in place. Wait here. Just sit tight. Um, do not leave Jerusalem and a gift will come to you. And that gift is going to be the Holy Spirit. And to them, this was all that they had been promised in um, kind of messianic prophecy um, that they would be immersed in God's presence. And you can see that in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Joel. Um, and so that is what they're hoping for. So here they're they're sheltering in place, they're waiting, um, but they're doing so hopefully, right? They have filled with hope. And that hope is rewarded. Um, we read already how in Acts chapter 2, you have the Holy Spirit that comes on like the blowing of a violent wind, fills the whole house where they're sitting, that tongues of fire seemed to come and rest on them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and um, were able to speak to each other in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. We know that everybody came to them, um, that Jews were all gathered there from every nation, and they all heard um, their testimony in their own language, um, which was really amazing. And all of this imagery, by the way, is... Um, very similar to the description of God's glory filling the temple. And so that's um, a really interesting connection here because in the advent of the Holy Spirit, this pouring out of the Holy Spirit, God is coming to dwell in his people, not a building. It's no longer that they have to say, okay, well, I'm going to go to this one building where only really the um, high priest gets to go into God's presence, right? Think of Moses getting to go see God on Mount Sinai, where God is there, but not directly connected or in the presence of his people. Um, but instead, we become God's temple. Um, and so no longer are we quarantined or separated from God, right? Because of our sins, we can never be quite um, clean enough, could never be quite clean enough to go into his presence. After God's, after Jesus's death on the cross for our sins, um, he fulfills that sacrifice now um, and sends us the Holy Spirit so that we can be in God's presence. So no longer are they quarantined from God. In essence, they're quarantined with God, right? The Holy Spirit comes on them, and now you can't get away from him. The Holy Spirit is in you. There is no getting away. God is in you um, as he's in the disciples here with the Holy Spirit, um, and that is an amazing thing that you have access to the creator of the universe um, anytime, at every moment. Um, what an honor that is. What an honor that is and a reason to celebrate. Um, and so we see the Holy Spirit as a gift, right? That's something that we're celebrating today. Um, it offers us both God's presence and his provision. It enables us, as it did the disciples, to re-enter society as God's witnesses. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Um, and at this point, he's at Cornelius' house, a Roman soldier, um, not a Jewish man. And um, the Holy Spirit there was poured out even on Gentiles. Even us, guys. The Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. So Peter received the holy message. He's able then to go out um, as God's witness, which is what Jesus commands him to do. So he's able to do that through the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
um, and then give that gift of the Holy Spirit to anyone else, right? The Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Acts chapter 11, verse 15 says, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them, still talking about that same situation, um, as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That was that command back in Acts. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? And they all heard that and they praised God. Right. So then even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads into life. And so through the Holy Spirit, this gift of the Holy Spirit, Peter is able to go into new areas. He's able to reach Gentiles and new people. And that's what the books of, of Acts is all about, how they go out to Judea and all the ends of the earth. Um, being witnesses for God, and they're able to do that through the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit that enables them to re-enter society, not as themselves, but as God's witnesses, um, and moves them in power. And so the Holy Spirit is something to celebrate today. It doesn't matter what tomorrow holds. It doesn't matter what you've been through and what your current situation is. Through the Holy Spirit, we have God's presence and God's provision. Um, and friends, that is more than enough. It is more than enough. In fact, it is above and beyond anything that we could rightfully or justly hope for. Um, it's a gift and it's full of joy. So I hope that today um, you find joy and the Holy Spirit in your life if you've had him. If, if you don't have him, now's a great time to pray. Um, ask Jesus into your heart. Ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, after Peter receives the Holy Spirit, he, when he's talking to the people who are all gathered there in Jerusalem, he quotes a Psalm of David and he said, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not le let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. And I encourage you to do a study and see how many times reference to the Holy Spirit is connected to joy. And it's my belief that the reason there is such joy is because there is joy in God's presence and in his provision. I hope that you guys, that we all, as we re-enter society um, in a very literal way in our lives right now, we remember that we are re-entering as God's witnesses filled with his Holy Spirit and that our lives would be full of joy that God's presence and his provision brings to us every day.